Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, this is the second event uh, of the Museum Youth Justice Series to Events and Angel Flash, um, which is a listening session entitled uh, How to Be a Teacher. Um, so, I'm here also for me, I'm an assistant trainer here at London, uh, and uh, I'm one of the new team uh, at the London Australian who are here initiated uh, this program, which is uh, co-curated uh, with the uh, Open Soviet. Um, this, um, this series is dedicated to uh, decolonial thinking and how it can be used uh, to reflect and uh, find uh, methods of resistance to imperialist and, uh, and colonial uh, rhetoric and practices in Europe and uh, in post colonial territories. Uh, and uh, this first chapter, um, especially um, is uh, is curated by the Young Post Soviet, who I'm, uh, I'm really happy to welcome again at Mudam. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it comes after the first event uh, where some of you were already, uh, which was a keynote lecture uh, by uh, Dr. F. Anus. Uh, the invitation to uh, from Mudam to the Young Post Soviet uh, departed from the urgency to address the issue of imperialism in post-Soviet territories due to the, the recent invasion of uh, Russia in Ukraine. I think it's worth uh, mention, mentioning it. And uh, there will be a second chapter after this one uh, of the Radio Disaster series, which will be led by the, the team at Mudam in uh, 2023 and which will uh, extend uh, the reflections around the coloniality to broader geographies. So taking into account uh, the situation of uh, Mudan, Mudan being in a Western uh, European uh, country. Um, also, as part of the research uh, for the listening session, but also uh, for the program at large, uh, the members of Beyond the Post Soviet uh, have been um, I've been invited to dig in a bit in the Mulan collection and to uh, lead some research uh, throughout the, the collection. And for this event, they chose uh, Vlad Kaurvat's uh, video that you can see in the, the studio and that uh, Patricia is going to um, introduce in uh, more details uh, later. It's in, entitled This Here and That There. And it's been chosen because it resonates uh, particularly with the methods and reflections that will be um, discussed over this event. So I invite you to uh, watch the video after the, the event if you haven't done so yet. And finally, uh, this event was also planned and uh, thought in coordination with the performance by Tanaka Tui and Yann Leguet that is happening at four in the Great Hall uh, in Tanaka Tui's uh, exhibition. So it will be a, a live activation, uh, another kind of listening session. Uh, so I invite you all to uh, join us for the second part of the afternoon at four uh, to maybe reflect on uh, what we will uh, talk about during this uh, listening session in a more meditative uh, environment. And now I leave the floor to my Hello, the Post Soviet. I just hope uh, the place to, to be closer to the mic. Hopefully, uh, our participants online also can hear us. It's like, you know, whole chair who is sitting there <laughs> has to speak. So, I'm Vilja Fisch, I'm a part of the collective Beyond the Soviet. Uh, together with uh, Sasha Pivak and Patricia Kuve and Katrina, Katrina Batanova, Marina Pankratova and Faina Yunusova, uh, who are also present today. Uh, so this event, um, How to be Anti-Colonial, as uh, Clementine said, it's the second event of the program and we call it as a, a listening session. How do we mean that? Uh, listening we perceive uh, as a practice, as a decolonial practice, uh, and also as a po uh, political statement. With listening, we acknowledge uh, our um, uh, that that we do not know, uh, not knowing the information, and our will to learn, to hear, uh, and to understand. Therefore, um, we also. Uh, um, approach uh, listening in the form of care and uh, care towards speakers, towards different narrations. Um, and to consider these sessions, we also started with the listening and we invited Lia Dostleva, artist uh, and uh, cultural uh, anthropologist, um, 
Uh, Vasily uh, Chirpanin, uh, art uh, activist and founder of Tree Biennial, uh, Renata Salechul, uh, and, uh, uh, who is a, a theoretician, and Tatiana Fedorova, creator and artist, uh, to, to become in one moment uh, a spontaneous collective and also to uh, search together and discuss together uh, the topics, the questions that we feel urged to discuss and to listen to and to hear uh, and together as a spontaneous collective uh, of us we were uh, designing and conceiving this event uh, and uh, I give the word to Sasha. <laughs> So, hello everyone, my name is Sasha Pevak. Uh, so, the colleagues told us that some of, the, some of you are here not for the first time for the program, so welcome very much. Thank you for joining again and for the newcomers, welcome. So, uh, just to remind you what happened during the first uh, lecture, so the first open lecture of the program, Colonial in Camouflage, was given by Eva Nuss. And she offered us some important clues of understanding what is Soviet and Russian colonialism and also some insights into the history of Soviet and Russian colonialism. Uh, also, she gave us some examples of resistance that appeared in literature and art to Soviet colonialism, in particular in the Baltic states. So today, uh, the framework is a bit different. So as Yulia said, we gather as a kind of spontaneous collective which was formed with the participants, but also with you today, and with the members of uh, the Mundam team. And I think that the mm, start of the Spontaneous Collective was this shared opinion that colonialism and coloniality are not only the fact of the past, but they continue to operate and impact, influence every aspect of our lives until today around the world. So, of course, the ongoing war of Russia against Ukraine is one of the examples, uh, and it carries many signs of a colonial war. Uh, for example, well, it is ideologically driven by contemporary Russian chauvinism and fascism, and by the visions of Ukrainians as spoiled and lost brothers who must be brought back to the so-called Russian world. It also takes the form, as you know, of territorial occupations, war crimes, mass killings and tortures of uh, civilians, destruction of critical infrastructure that we see in recent months, and also, of course, of looting and destruction of culture, of cultural heritage. Uh, at the same time, in many parts of the world, we also see the alarming rise and normalization of uh, extreme right, crypto-fascist and fascist movements whose ideologies may be echo uh, those of colonialism. So how do we then define and identify colonialism? What anti-colonial strategies can we adopt today as individuals, but also uh, as artists or cultural workers? How do we uh, detect the camouflage, you know, this camouflage of colonialism? And how, how do we reverse this logic? How, we do, how do we make colonialism visible and the traces of what it has done visible? And also, what is the responsibility of art and the institutions? We are an institution art of art. What is the responsibility of these institutions in anti-colonial struggle? And maybe finally, uh, how do we imagine our coming futures? So what comes after empires and after the post-Soviet? So these are a few questions that uh, we will uh, raise together today uh, through the contributions of speakers and also through a collective discussion. And now we give the word to Patricia. Yes. I think for our online participants, we know um, watch some stills of the video that is present in, in the Madame. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'll share them now. And uh, so as Clementine mentioned, uh, one of the ambitions of colonialism in camouflage is to engage with Madame and its collection. And as a collective uh, beyond the post-Soviet, we had the opportunity to uh, do some research, uh, but also to, um, yeah, to do some research around the works by artists uh, from the so-called post-Soviet and post-socialist countries of Europe acquired by the museums throughout this history. And among the questions uh, that we had in mind is the hierarchy, uh, hierarchical setup and power relations produced which as you can see, we will also try to tackle through the setup of this meeting. 
uh, one work in particular this year and that there by the artist Vladka Orfat caught our, our attention. It is a video which drew a sequence of stills, uh, which translates in eight hours in an in interrupted performance realized in 2009 uh, in the front of the Osda Kultur der Welt in Berlin. Uh, this piece was temporarily installed in a museum. Uh, those in Luxembourg probably saw it at the entrance of this space. Um, and for the online audience, you can just watch it um, now. Uh, in this video, we see the, uh, the artist manipulating 50 identical chairs in the large fountain. By displacing the chair, she constructs and deconstructs temporary uh, arrangements and structures that can remind us of some well known social setup, like meetings, encounters, conference gathering, but also battles and confrontations. Sometimes the structure become more abstract and uh, not recognizable, but it blurs the um, relations of power that this um, setup shows. Um, yeah, that's it for me. I think Julia will take out the floor for the next. I will do a small note. Uh, I will try also to have to take a hot chair. Um, so, and yeah, while designing this session, uh, we were questioning also spatial and temporal organization of our encounter today, now. And therefore, I refer to Vladka's uh, work where she also tries to deconstruct it. And while discussing colonial and imperial structures that are still present, uh, also with the organization of this event and encounter, we try also to deconstruct um, this spatial relationship that sometimes are offered for us uh, as unquestionable or present, and we kind of agree with that. Um, and um, therefore, first of all, we try to consider this, this um, meeting before also designing as a, as a collective, but also today we invite you to be and to feel um, as an active participant and therefore we will have like a soft moderation but that means that everyone uh, is welcome to step in to, to give a point to ask questions or uh, uh, to make a statement so you're very welcome and this is how we will proceed uh, and also um, uh, our online participants um, will uh, join us in the dis discussion. So, um, we agreed to start with a contribution by Vasil Chiripani. Um, each contribution will last about 10 minutes, let's say, so there will be four of them, and then we should have this uh, discussion with very soft motivation. So uh, we begin with Vasil. I will just say a few words uh, about you, Vasil. So Vasil is head of uh, the Visual Culture Research Center, uh, the CMRC, which uh, you co-founded in Kyiv in 2008 as a platform for collaboration between academic, artistic, and activist communities. VCRC, among other things, is also the organizer of Kyiv uh, Biennial and uh, one of the co-founders of the platform of East Europe Biennial Alliance. Uh, and it was during the last edition of the Kyiv uh, Biennial in 2021, and precisely after a panel discussion uh, on the topic of global socialism and decolonization in Eastern Europe, that I had a chance to meet you. And we have since stayed in contact, and I think uh, with the group we followed the activities of Russell and also many publications, uh, also the ones that appeared since the full-scale invasion. Um, so, yes, this is, I think, this uh, shared interest and shared, yeah, really shared interest um, and shared opinions with you that um, incited us to, to invite you to, to join the, the collective. So now I'm giving you the word. Please. I believe that we were supposed to stay, right? Yeah. If you don't mind. Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but also just to, we, oh, sorry, <laughs> with respect to, to our online uh, our online guests. Um, okay. So first of all, uh, thanks so much uh, to the museum and to the Beyond the Post Soviet Union and Sasha for kindly having me here. Uh, I really appreciate a lot this uh, opportunity to talk uh, 
to you today because uh, as Sasha already pointed out uh, I am uh, actually obviously coming from from the country which is uh, has been experiencing as and is experiencing an ongoing occupation annexation kidnapping filtration camps deportations mass graves torture chambers so um, it's, uh, it's only this constant awareness of these realities that I have, which, which allows me to speak to you, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be able even to speak about these, uh, these matters. So I have to keep a kind of a fidelity to this reality check, kind of a truth on the ground, which allows me to express uh, myself. But, and also, um, for that matter, I'm also super privileged, of course, to, to be here because I am abroad only due to the special permit from the Ministry of Culture, which allowed me to, to travel uh, abroad and to leave uh, Ukraine. So in this sense, I also would like to thanks to the Ukrainian military, without which uh, I wouldn't be able to come here. Perhaps I wouldn't even exist. For sure, my country wouldn't exist, at least in the form it currently does. And uh, I'm sure that you here would be busy with totally different agenda, right? If not the Ukrainian military resistance, that's, that's uh, for sure. So uh, I'm also very thankful for bringing in this topic of um, uh, colonialism, post-coloniality and decolonization. And uh, it is especially important with regards to to this war because of its uh, specificity. Because unlike uh, many other uh, military conflicts and uh, warfare affairs uh, of the last, uh, let's say, 30 years, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, this war is really kind of unique or very specific. And uh, so it has, of course, a kind of um, fascist genocidal dimension obviously but it has very much a colonial dimension as well so what do I mean by this is basically that um, unlike uh, many many other conflicts which are currently ongoing and uh, that we had to experience uh, before this war is not simply the war between two countries so it's really pretty mistakeable to depict it as a Russian Ukrainian war we can elaborate this, that perhaps during the discussion I believe so this war is not also a war between two armies and uh, this is also not a war between the army and the insurgency right but this war what makes it really a colonial fascist war is the war of one country's military against the other country's people who had been simply deprived the right to exist right as uh, by the as it was stated by the uh, by the russian aggressor and the biggest problem i, I find uh, in in this uh, context because it's we can also discuss uh, the the russian colonialism and the russian current fascist uh, regime but also i think with if we apply this context on the pan-European scale, what I find really super, super uh, dangerous is basically that how come that we all, uh, being part of this, allowed this colonial fascist war to happen again, right? And uh, what I find really problematic and somehow I think the majority of uh, Europeans, mostly the EU citizens, uh, are not fully aware of, uh, unfortunately, because uh, still there is a kind of a tendency in the EU to, to perceive this war as somebody else's war, right? Because the major discussion in the EU about this war is about energy prices and, uh, and uh, gas and uh, oil, right? Uh, whereas um, I think that the biggest uh, blow up in a way to the idea of freedom and to the idea of Europe for that matter is that um, even before the 24th of February this year, uh, if we kind of step back, if it's in general possible, and look at the uh, sort of at the European continent as such, right? What we actually see is that 
uh, all the European countries, in principle, somehow agreed in advance that an, the other European country could be occupied, deprived of all its institutions, its sovereignty, its independence, and the rest of Europe could get along with it. I think that this is the biggest danger at the moment, and uh, unfortunately the EU will definitely pay much higher price for this agreement, right? So, uh, because it's not just a repetition of the Chamberlain moment and, and so on, but uh, and I, I think that uh, the, one of the explanations for that is basically uh, very much uh, relies on, on the um, colonial or post-colonial premise, in a way. What do I mean by this is basically that um, somehow, uh, because actually what the uh, so-called Russian Federation I say so-called because Russia has never been a federation, right? It's just not true. Uh, and uh, it can be whatever called, but for, for sure not a federation. Uh, but what, the, what Russia and uh, many, many West European powers actually share is the colonial, coloniality or at least the colonial past. Right? And I think that it is exactly Europe's kind of post-colonial legacy uh, and uh, its current, uh, in a way, neo-colonial approach that uh, it's uh, Europe's inability to, to, uh, to think in colonial terms and apply them to the present was one of the reasons why Europe agreed on this aggression, why this war was allowed to happen as such. And what I find here is really problematic and what has been always amazing somehow for me uh, is actually that uh, in spite of all its progressivity, post-colonial or decolonial discourse has, uh, has been so much nationalized across Europe because each country is dealing with its own colonialism, digging deep something from its own past. Uh, at the same time, keeping a blind eye uh, towards colonialism in the present and applied on the same even continent, right? Because we can often, often heard that uh, the realities of the East of Europe uh, don't fit to co post-coloniality, to colonial discourse, right? That is a kind of a wrong experience. It, it, it cannot be really inscribed in, in post-colonial framework, that post-colonial Western theory cannot be uh, exercised in Europe's East, but actually this premise has to be rather reversed. It's not the East European experience that is wrong, it's rather the post-colonial theory that has a fundamental mistake in its basic origin that it doesn't allow to be applied uh, towards the same part actually of the of the continent. And even more, I would, I would go even further that uh, the realities of East Europe are so much central to colonialism on a global scale and so much mm, crucial th that it is exactly this reason that makes them somehow invisible within the framework of, of this theory. Because this theory resides very comfortably on the typical dichotomy between the global north and global south. Right? And uh, post-Soviet, especially Europe's East, simply doesn't fit to this, uh, uh, to this uh, opposition, to this binary uh, division, right? At the same time, uh, there has been a long tradition of constant interaction between the Western metropoles and the Russian metropoles, right? And uh, both felt uh, pretty, pretty comfortable in, in that regard. At the same time, if we take a look at the uh, especially post-Soviet Europe's East, right? It is exactly, it's, uh, it's, it's even more than colonial, right? Because the, the kind of a def definitive feature of this region that so many countries, uh, not only Ukraine, of course, uh, has been, uh, have been living under direct military Russian occupation, at least for decades and the direct military occupation. It's not just some global south. And this is actually one of the characteristics that differentiates uh, the colonial experiences in Europe's east 
from the so-called global south context, right? Because maybe on on economic terms they can be found on the same page, right? But it is exactly these military political uh, conditions that differentiate uh, these contexts very much. And if we look from this colonial or decolonial perspective on this region, uh, we can also uh, define and uh, distinguish all the variety of anti-colonial strategies, deoccupation attempts, which are basically of a global importance. But the, uh, but what I find really problematic is that even after the crash, uh, just to wrap it up, after the crash of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, somehow the attitude from the side of the EU, especially from the western side of the western part of the of the Union, right, towards the Europe's east, uh, was kind of a Mm, was was uh, sort of framed as a um, Eastern Partnership policy, which is basically the continuation of the so-called Ostpolitik approach, which in turn is basically the continuation of what Edward Said, of course, called Orientalism. Right. What I mean is uh, that uh, that the idea of United Europe, in being based on the on the premise of overcoming the political division of Europe and uh, in, inscribing Europe's East into a general framework, instead simply, so after the crash of the Soviet Union, this idea was transformed into the policy towards neighborhoods, right? It was not our common house policy. It was some neighborhoods, which are typical colonial discourse, which are under civilized, which are barbaric, which have lots of traces of totalitarianism, they are not ready enough, you have to catch up. What I believe Habermas uh, framed, uh, coined as uh, catching up revolution, that you have to, to run fast, like in Alice in Wonderland, you have to run very fast in order to, to be there where you are. So in, in this sense, uh, and by the way, also just one last note that this is also very much applied to this uh, idea of what is now in the general European discourse called pacifism, right? Which is a totally wrong term. Uh, like it's, it reminds me of the term crisis. Like when, when we don't know how to approach the situation, we use, we use usually some, some terms which are just hiding the, the realities. So all this idea of non-escalation, not provoking the Kremlin, not to support, uh, not to supply weaponries so much crucially needed in the, uh, for the country at war, is actually uh, the, the, I, the basic uh, premise of this idea is, is very much colonial one, because this is uh, the idea about who has the right to violence, right? And as we know from the colonial history, it is exactly the colonizers who can be armed and uh, defend themselves. Not, uh, not the colonized. Colonized simply are deprived of this uh, right to apply violence, especially when it's uh, needed. And here I see actually the task of the cultural institutions, to be honest, that uh, if we reconsider and reconfigure the colonial framework as such, and if we also uh, try to expand it towards the rest of the continent, we would have and we would uh, come up with a totally different theory of coloniality and decolonialism and for that matter with a totally different idea of Europe as such. I put comma here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Vasily. Um, so the, I, I um, just uh, also to give a remark on, on the way we proceed today. So now we listen, only listen, and then we start the discussion uh, after all our guests will come to word. Uh, and um, I would like to introduce our next guest. Uh, it's Lia Dosliva. And Lia, um, I remember I com came across uh, uh, your article in Block Magazine on the colonial approach to Russian culture. And after that, you uh, decided and you agreed to take part in the online um, event dedicated to the decolonial vocabulary together with Aliftina Kahidze. And now, finally, we have the honor to have you here, present and to meet in person. Thank you for that. 
Um, Leah, you're an artist and cultural uh, anthropologist, uh, and um, also one of the recent focuses was uh, uh, tracing, um, uh, uh, Un uncovering the traces that are hidden and uh, if I remember correctly one of the last uh, project and interest of yours also to get to dig uh, into the soil which is um, covering the traces and raising that but also preserving it uh, like a fossils uh, and uh, I give the word to you too. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, can I have my presentation? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you for having me here. And I also want to thank Sil, who already told most of what I wanted to tell here. I mean, theoretical background because after the uh, previous one. Ah, yes, yes, yes. 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 Oops. And maybe Ooh. no. Oh my God. And maybe we can somehow move. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Ah. Oops. And you probably have somehow to stop from moving by itself. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Uh, after. Uh, 24th of February, uh, I think this idea that the colonial approach also could be uh, pretty much applied uh, on this called so-called post-Soviet situation is uh, now becoming kind of mainstream because before it was super controversial thing to say. Every time you are trying to say, but look, this is also <coughs> colonial dynamic in here. Look this power structure is also like super imperial and super colonial. You will be mocked and ridiculed and some uh, wise uh, white uh, heterosexual cis man would advise you to read some books actually and educate yourself. So yes, thank you, you already mentioned it. And also I wrote uh, some articles about that because I mean, after the full scale invasion started, we also uh, had to do some explaining have to, I don't know, to know, to spread this narrative uh, a little bit wider. Uh, and this uh, project I'm going to talk about, uh, actually, I started to work on it long before the full scale invasion started, which is also a problem you will see. Uh, because, I mean, I've been working with collective and historical trauma for some time. And uh, when I was working in Isolatia, you also might have, uh, might have heard this name is the Latvia Foundation. Uh, they were based in Donetsk, then Donetsk was occupied, they moved uh, to Kyiv, uh, and uh, in their premises in Donetsk now is a torture chamber in prison, and we don't know how many people are still there and what is happening there as we speak. Yeah, so it's also a very problematic story, and I was working with them as creator a few years ago, and uh, actually they had this idea they want to that they want to go back to east because they felt that they belong like more like in east part of eastern part of Ukraine than in Kiev. And so uh, when I work with I worked with them as creator, we were researching uh, it's, it's not working down. Down? Yeah. It's not working? Um, try now. Maybe someone yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we were researching, uh, we were doing some research. And this book I found in the Bakhmut uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, yeah, uh, and it's called Three Bites of the Donetsk Basin. And it's a super boring book <laughs> about trilobites. About what? Tri trilobites. Uh, so, how do we. Oh, yeah, those guys. <laughs> Uh, like some 500 million years ago, they used to live in the ocean, which used to be at this place where is like Donetsk now. Uh, yeah, so uh, I came across this book. Yeah, this is like where is this called and Donetsk the sea. Uh, I mean, <coughs> this book is what I meant, boring. 
just about, you know, trilobites. Some fossils you can find uh, in Tarkoal, but also in limestone. Uh, also, you know, some schemes, some drawings. Uh, but I mean, what was interesting about this book is the year of publication. It's like 1933. It was the same year when Soviet Ukraine was dying, actually. I mean, it was cold more years. Uh, yeah, here is a monument in Washington. Uh, and I mean, what had happened there? Uh, Soviet Union had this idea of industrialization, right? So they built coal mines, uh, uh, heavy industry in this eastern region, right? And also they had this idea that uh, we don't need any private property, we have to uh, employ this project of uh, collectivization. So they kind of started to basically take all food from people, from peasants mostly, which led to starvation and which led to uh, around 4 million people who died because of that. It's kind of pretty hard to estimate real amount because we don't know how to do that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, just imagine uh, some guy, uh, educated person from St. Petersburg, I come to the region where these coal mines are in order to discover, to research, to find some traces of ancient history. And he can do this because he's a part of this uh, like Soviet knowledge structure. Yeah, and uh, when Soviet states started to industrialize itself, they started to like dig up this coal and this limestone. Uh, there were trilobites, right, in this coal and this limestone. So, uh, and this guy just came there to actually do his work. I mean, nothing bad in there. He's just recovering some traces of ancient history. Uh, and in exact same region, uh, more or less at the same time, people were dying from starvation and they were buried in mass graves, like everywhere. And uh, why I mentioned that I started to work uh, on this project long before the full scale invasion started, it's because actually of mass graves, because when I like decided that I want to work with this. For me, mass graves were a part of history, you know. It was something that we read about in books. We can find some photos in archives. Nothing like, you know, recent actual experience or news feed. Yeah, and I applied to this project for some grants. I received some. I'm fine. Uh, fine. Um, like I mean, I'm at Jan van Eyck Academy with this project. Uh, I applied more than one year ago. Then the work started. Uh, yeah, this I think is most famous picture from Hovedmore uh, by Alexander Wienerberger. Uh, Austrian engineer who came to Kharkiv and made some pictures. I mean, it's the most nicest one I've ever seen because I'm not going to show you any drastic pictures. You easily can Google them. But when I was already working on this project, uh, some creator yeah, in Poland uh, who writes a book about uh, projects he likes, he was like, oh, okay, Leah, I'm mentioning this project of yours in my book. I put uh, some pictures of your works in there, but I think it would be nice to add some archival pictures. Could you send me some? I answered that, oh, sure, I could, but I want. No, 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 send me some. And I sent him, and he called like in five minutes. Oh my God, fuck. I mean, it's. Uh, it also was before the full scale invasion started. So, I mean, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, 
I like to work with this, you know, traces in general, traces of something, traces of something hidden. Uh, and also here is uh, soil, this idea of soil as a source of knowledge, but also as a method to, to hide it, like literally hide it, because people were buried in mass graves and for as long as Soviet Union music existed, it was forbidden to even mention that it happened. And when I started actually work on this project, I mean, I read this book, uh, I also checked uh, these places uh, where this guy was working with the map of Holodomor, because some like burial places are known and they are on a map of Holodomor Museum online. You can easily check it. And uh, I found some spots which are you know, overlapping. I mean, technically, this, uh, his research happened like a few years, a year before Holdemore started. But I mean, sometimes it's even same village. Same village where firstly this guy came to, you know, to discover some beautiful ancient history and then some people came to, you know, bury peasants in mass graves. Yeah, uh, this is in Poland and Poznan, it's still happening, I think. This show is in view for a few days. Still, so if you're flying to Poznan, like tomorrow, you probably still can see it. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I tried to do here is to put together the simultaneous notion of human history and violence, but also non-human history and also violence, because uh, what Soviet Union did to nature is also pretty much violence, because it was raped, excavated, yeah, and beautiful steppe landscape was uh, landscape was turned into, you know, this post-industrial landscape of sort. Yeah, some few pictures. I mean, I created textile sculptures of trilobites because that's how they work. Yeah, I mean. yeah, and on, about traces. I decided to put this picture in the last. Uh, it's from today. It's from my Twitter feed. It's uh, remains of uh, Russian rockets gathered together in Kharkiv. I mean, traces. Yeah. Thank you, Leah. I think we <clears throat> move uh, slowly toward our next speaker, um, Tatiana Chudorova, who is online with us. Uh, you are a, an artist, a performer, but also a curator based in uh, Moldavia. Uh, and we came across your um, research uh, via the Kajat platform uh, based in Bucharest. Um, and uh, so your artistic explorations focus on the lost Soviet identity and formations of a new identity for a Moldovian woman facing social, political and economic problems. Uh, you will show some videos and photos about your um, own projects, but uh, it's also worth mentioning that when we uh, met you, you started this suddenly became a <laughs> yeah but patricia i think it's uh, the connection so maybe i will just finish oh, my God. <laughs> oh no now now we so please go on now we we see and hear you and if okay. it stops then i will finish yeah where did i stop uh it stopped when you were saying why uh we uh were interested in um, tatiana's practice and in her thinking of a Moldova is a peripheral context, more or less. Okay, okay, good. Um, so yeah, the, the project I was mentioning, the project Corridor, uh, which reflect on the position of Moldovia, uh, a country that we used to be considered as a, a peripheral, but which became central, um, which position became central after the full-scale invasions on the 24th of February as a humanitarian corridor. So please, Tatiana. 
Did you hear me? Yeah. I'm sharing the... Now it's okay? Yes, yes. Um, so I want to present myself. I am an artist from Republic Moldova, Fyodorov Tatiana, and I was born and raised in the Soviet Moldova. Moldova. But my formation as an artist happens in 2000. And uh, 10, uh, 10 years of my research is focused on the topic post-Soviet. What does interest it to, to me? As for Medina Tolstanova, the tradition of the colonial discourse in one interview said that for her, this is a matter of self-identification. So I agree with that. From one hand, I feel myself post-Soviet, different, and on the other hand, contemporary globalization adds new components to the uh, definition of myself. I explore the traces of the river side of the Soviet modernization project, but also the traces, the establishing of neoliberal globalism and the challenges associated with it. It can be said that my current self-identification is an artist from periphery who comprehends the experience of uh, living both on the periphery of post-Soviet space and the periphery near the border of uh, you. It's necessary to explain a little, a little bit that after gaining, uh, gaining independence of 1991 uh, and after the armed conflict in Transnistria in 1992, Moldova remains divided in two parts, Republic Moldova and uh, the unrecognized state of Transnistria. And I start my presentation with the drawing from the Syria Soviet ruins found object to speak and show my context uh, where I live. Uh, this series of the watercolors is attempt to collect and archive materials related to the post-Soviet. And this object I found in one of the Moldavian village on the right bank of the Dniestri on autumn 2001. And it is the staircase of rural house with a concrete carpet painted in the colors of the flag of Moldavian Soviet Republic. And it was, uh, was absurd for me to see that the owners of this house continue to walk on this uh, concrete carpet till now. But the paradox is that, that this flag of Soviet Moldova is still existing and the unrecognized state of Transnistria located on the left <coughs> bank of the Dniestre. Uh, also, you can see other drawing from the same Syria. Uh, in Russian and Ukraine, it's Sol Bol Sil, but in English, Sol Paint Sol. Uh, so this uh, found object, uh, it's a package of the salt, attracted attention when the salt in, was disappeared in Moldova, when the way in Ukraine was started. It was a result that the largest produce of rock, rock salt in Donetsk region was stopped walking. And the Soviet design of this packaging which has been circulated in the post-Soviet space till now, became the starting point of working with this object and the pain that was in me in that time. And I think I was will be a product of the Soviet imperial heritage as one of the post-colonial other. Uh, I am from Ukraine Moldavian family, and my mother is from a small Ukrainian village, Cherkese, from the fa family Shapovalenka near Odessa, and my father was from Moldavian village Mikaus from the family Lefter. When I was growing up, I did not feel that I am belong to the Moldavian and Ukrainian culture. In the family, we speak Russian and a Finnish Russian school. And I, uh, I was more attracted to the Soviet Russian speaking culture than the following national tradition. Despite the fact that it's my childhood, I often went to relatives in Belgrade, Nistrovsk in Ukraine and also to Moldavian village. I felt like a Soviet person not tied very much to national roots. As a result, I am Russified Moldavian. So I studied my identity. And on uh, one hand, I cleared uh, to see that the Russian language was instrument for common language to, uh, for communication. But on the other hand, we see a big influence and ex expansion of this language as a result of Russification and subjugation of local language and culture. Uh, there are still discussion in scientific circles where the USSR was colonial empire. And Sergei Abashin, who is engaged in post-colonial study in Central Asia, views the USSR through the optics of both modernization and colonialism, emphasizing that we must simultaneously see violence and subjugation, and at the same time, some form of emancipation and reform. Uh, for example, comprehending the reconstructing the past through the gender optic, 
What does emancipation in the Soviet time mean today? In my artistic research, I focus on understanding the artificial construct of identity of the Soviet woman was created in the USSR, how it was formed, what tools were involved. Through the my essay, Who is a New Mo Woman, artistic book, Factory Red Star, and the publication In Search of the Body of the Textile Industry, I will touch on the subject of emancipation of the Soviet woman, considering through the prism of the colonial patriarchal project, the project of subordinating women to the Soviet state. The woman, unlike, unlike the woman model of the emancipation, was the object, not the subject of the policy. Here are some images from the book Factory Red Star and publication. I researched the exploitation of female labor with industrial and post-industrial politics till nowadays in period of neoliberal politics. And I would, I would like to show also uh, an artist book, Soviet Passport, which I made in 2014. This do document circulated for quite a long time to the post-Soviet space in Ukraine to, till 2002, in Belarus, Belarus 2004, Georgia 2005, Republic uh, Moldova till 2014, and Transnistria till now, it's, uh, this document is circulated. People could vote, receive pension, and even travel. In 2014, I photographed people with passport both in Moldova and Transnistria and interviewed with them. You can see here one of citizens from Transnistria who received uh, a Soviet passport in 1996, already where the USSR didn't exist. Many of the people I interviewed, uh, of, of course, most of them all generation, and some of them are nostalgic for that time not realizing what a colonial instrument this document was. For example, this last model of the Soviet passport was started to circulate in 1974. The date is quite a very significant. Only from that moment, the peasant can receive a passport. Uh, we are able to depart to the villages and enjoy privilege on the equal basis with everyone else. Here are some photos uh, from the Syria Lenin and peasants from family archive. As an artist, I work with archive, especially with family archive, inherited from my father. He was a non-Soviet artist, designer, and photographer, and died very early when I have uh, six years old. If we, we review the back, we will see another year in 1949 in Moldova, the mass deportation of the peasants, which lost a housing and land, later became the, mm, the property of the collective farm. And in 1964, the big hunger in Moldova. So I researched the fate of the peasant during the 20th century and nowadays. And uh, to return to nowadays, I would like to show some images from the uh, curatorial project corridor. The exhibition was open on 5th June and exists till now. It was a response. Uh, to the started way in Ukraine. And Moldova has become a transit zone, a humanitarian corridor that through which the refugees pass from that, uh, uh, pass more than the population of Moldova itself. And I create this humanitarian corridor as a physical space with the supporting of the artists from the post-Soviet countries in order to comprehend the common past, realize the present and think about the future. And as a, part, as a part of exhibition, I wonder who is stealing our future? And the question was asked to the visitors of the exhibition, also the artists, and the results of interaction, uh, the collective library was created and also response-based publication. Also, we have a panel discussion uh, with the cultural workers from the Armenia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And, uh, uh, as uh, answering the question, what will be common future and what comes after empire after the post-Soviet? I remember one remark from the researcher from the online meeting, probably it was in Kiev Biennale in the frame of what, uh, who said that uh, this outbreak of the war in Ukraine, the post-Soviet time has ended and we at the beginning of something else. And with this, I would like uh, to end my presentation saying thank you for the attention.
Yes, thank you very much, Tatiana, for, for these insights into your practice uh, and into your curatorial projects. So we move on to the last uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, Renata Salet. Uh, so we actually met Renata uh, last September in Paris during one uh, assembly related to culture and cultural policies. And uh, Renata uh, works as a philosopher and sociologist. And she's a senior researcher at the Institute of Criminology at the Faculty of Law in Ljubljana, Slovenia and also a professor at the School of uh, Law and Birbeck uh, College sorry, in London. Um, Renata, you also held numerous visiting professorships at Cardozo School of Law in New York, at Humboldt University in Berlin, at Duke University in Durham, and, and many others. Your work is interdisciplinary, and uh, Renata focuses on bringing together law, criminology, the study of political ideologies, and also psychoanalysis. And I think that what pushed us to, um, to invite Renata to join the collective is our discussions that we had with you in Paris, but also afterwards on coloniality and in particular on the coloniality of mind and also on the role of apathy uh, as a driven force um, for the rise of dictatorships in Eastern Europe and also apathy in the face of uh, neoliberal ideologies which arrived in Eastern Europe. Thank so you. we give you the word, Renata, please. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very glad to be part of uh, this panel. Um, yes, I will address a little bit uh, its kind of colonization of our mind, our thinking. Uh, I was raised in the former Yugoslavia, which uh, broke with Stalin uh, in '48, and therefore I cannot speak from sort of like kind of a being uh, living in a colonized uh, country similar to other speakers. However, we did uh, have, you know, socialism. And in some way, what I want to address today is that uh, we have sort of kind of moved uh, in a new direction of, let's say, um, colonial, colonizing the minds of the people than what happened in the past. Um, my research in the past when uh, I started actually as a researcher was focusing on controlling uh, people's minds with the help of ideology and uh, in socialism this control I think differed significantly from how it works today. Now today we have much more broad ideology on the one hand kind of the ideology of neoliberalism, the ideology of choice, uh, which permeates uh, sort of, let's say, uh, our uh, world. But on the other hand, what is really important to tackle is that we have a shift in our understanding of truth. Now, we live in times of social media where, you know, secret algorithms are very much determining which information uh, gets visibility. And of course, we also live in times of intricate web of state propaganda which often creates a cacophony of voices where truth and facts are easily obscured and manipulated. And here, of course, uh, with the start of uh, aggression um, in, in Ukraine, we have seen this attempt, you know, like on the side of the Russians to truly manipulate the question of what is true and what is uh, not. Now, this kind of a polarization um, which is sort of happening uh, today, where some people believe something is true and sub something not, uh, ha have been very much kind of, let's say, provoking feelings of identification with one group. We often live in kind of an information bubble. But the problem today is not simply that people are trying to passionately persuade others to believe in something that they believe, Quite often, we also observe a phenomenon that, you know, conspiracy theorists or people who are sharing, uh, you know, fake news, lies on Internet actually do not believe in what they are sharing. Uh, in my last book, uh, A Passion for Ignorance, uh, which just came out in paperback uh, these days by Princeton University Press, I was analyzing, you know, this phenomenon because my question was, what are the gains when we, you are sharing lies? 
Um, and of course, you you get two gains. First is that uh, you get uh, clicks, uh, you you get uh, a confirmation um, uh, from your own group, uh, a certain kind of a recognition, and then you get a recognition when the other group, people who believe in something else, are uh, sort of angry when they respond uh, online. Uh, um, with with uh, being upset and so on and sort of from wounding another you get uh, another kind of an emotional uh, recognition um, which people are you know craving in a strange way now what is truth and what is lie has been very much part uh, from the start of the Ukrainian Ukrainian uh, war war in Ukraine. And I remember um, when uh, when at the start of the war, there was the opposition um, uh, uh, expressed um, by Marina Osyanikova, employee of the Russian television, who, you know, on the main Russian uh, TV channel, interrupted the evening news by holding the large handwritten poster declaring no war, stop the war, don't believe the propaganda. Now, Osyanikova, before she did this uh, uh, gesture, uh, you know, she told to her friend that she was a child of an Ukrainian father and a Russian mother, and she felt anger and shame for having for years spread Kremlin propaganda. So she finally started to speak against the war. But after this protest, when Osyanikova was detained and initially she re received a relatively mild punishment. Later, she was threatened with a much bigger punishment, which is why not long ago she escaped from the country. Now, when the, when the first punishment happened, social media quickly started spreading the information that the whole protest was staged. The idea was that the Russian regime wanted to show that dissent was still allowed and that people opposing the government get lenient sentences. Now, simultaneously, however, a counter argument started circulating on social media, which stated that the Oceanica protest, you know, was actually kind of a fake and it was sort of like part of Russian propaganda itself. So suddenly after this protest, we had a debate whether protest was staged or real and in a way this debate overshadowed the message what you know Oceanica was trying to which which Oceanica was trying to convey so we can see that we are living now in this debate what is true and what is false which steers more passions you know than you know a certain kind of let's say a gesture um, which very much touched the truth of of the war now an important change in regard to truth happened. Now, in the past, in the Soviet times, um, you probably remember Václav Havel, who later became president of Czech Republic, was in the 70s very much speaking about the need to live in truth. So in his essay, The Power of the Powerless, Havel speaks about the greengrocer who privately did not believe in the communist ideology, but publicly every year on May 1st, he obeyed the party and put in the window of his shop the required poster which declared workers of the world unite. Now, Greengrocer uh, did this just out of the fear and the habit but privately he had different beliefs. So Havel imagined that one day the greengrocer would stop putting the slogans in the shop and would speak the truth. He would tell openly that he does not believe in the regime. And you know, Havel further imagined, imagined that other people would follow. And this, this attempt to live with truth, this kind of gestures of disobedience would shatter the world of appearance and lies, which uh, for Havel were fundamental pillar of the system. So if more people would stage a dissent, the regime would be threatened. Havel, however, didn't imagine that more than two decades after his death, it would be in the interest of power to make matters of what is truth and what is lies so confusing that people would be passionately debating 
more whether the protest against propaganda was real or fake than you know about the lies that propaganda is spreading. So what we see in post-socialist authoritarian regimes like the one established in Vladimir Putin's Russia is that this demand for kind of a consistent narrative ceased to exist. Peter Pomeranzo, a Kiev-born writer and TV producer now living in London, has pointed out that Russia became governed by political technologists at the start of the new millennium. Now, the problem was not only that truth can be brutally censored, but also that people no longer cared about truth. So life became a kind of a reality show where Putin was the main star like a performance artist who changed from one role to another. Sometimes he looked like a businessman, another time like a soldier, then bare-chested hunter, spy, tsar, or superman. Now, in this Russian reality show, what is truth and what is lie became irrelevant. <clears throat> but the propaganda machine also worked hard to instill doubt and confusion into other regimes in the world. For example, with meddling in elections, among them US elections. So we can see that in a number of ways in the last decade, ignorance about truth and facts have been in effectively encouraged on the one hand by authoritarian regimes. So authoritarian regimes today actually profit from this doubt. Now we can also say that capitalism uh, profits from what have been called the merchants of doubt. We have seen, you know, how, you know, for, for example, intricate propaganda mechanisms undermine scientific discoveries. It started with smoking, then climate change, COVID-19. And, you know, similarly, for example, like Russian government claimed that there was no war in Ukraine others around the world, for example, before the war happened, were denying that something like coronavirus exists and they perceived everything related to COVID-19 as fake. Now, another very important uh, point about you know, colonialism today is also that we live under the perception that if you work hard, you can get to any information or that something like, you know, knowledge economy exists that, you know, that we are kind of driven by the idea to get, have more information, better technologies and so on. Um, there have been quite a lot of discussions in knowledge economy and I will not go into it now, but some have pointed out that actually we are not living in times of so-called you know, ability to find new information or even knowledge economy, but more something that have been named ignorance econ economy, which is that there are so many ways of knowledge being prohibited, not only through censorship and state propaganda, but also, you know, sort of being, you know, impossible to come close to with patents, you know, with all kinds of, let's say, legal mechanisms, which are sort of preventing people actually to have access to what science, uh, for example, has uh, established or, you know, kind of knowledge economy on which, let's say, our economic development actually relies. So on the one hand, we have prohibition or kind of, let's say, um, censorship that observes, that we can observe in many parts of the world nowadays. Uh, on the other hand, we have the type of hierarchies in regard to knowledge that you know are established on Google or other search algorithms where secret algorithms are working in the way that we don't know and pushing some knowledge higher up than another. And then on the other hand, we have you know all kinds of let's say secret data, power pet computer, complicated software, and you know the the trademarks, the copyrights, which are limiting access to knowledge. So in the conclusion, I would say that when we're speaking with about colonialism today, 
we should actually go beyond th thinking about sort of like occupying the lands or, you know, enslaving the people, um, you know, sort of uh, changing uh, the culture, which are all important studies. And they have been very much part of the um, studies of colonialism in the past. I think that more and more we should look at also the new type of colonization of the mind, the playing with the truth, or let's say the uh, playing with the doubt in regard to truth, and also, you know, be very much critical of the way capitalism today uses new types of strategies to limit access to knowledge and to information. Thank you. I think uh, it's uh, the time to open up discussion. And uh, first, uh, I would like to ask uh, audiences here and online if someone wants to, to put a question or remark. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I have maybe a question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just to remind you the, the, the play of these dancing chairs, so when we, uh, we speak, we have to be close to the microphone. I had a question for Vasil, I think, especially, even though uh, uh, Tatiana also uh, gave an example of that. Uh, I was wondering if you had concrete examples of uh, cultural institutions like investing in, um, in the discourse uh, to like, raise awareness uh, towards um, colonial, like the persistence of uh, colonial practices and rhetorics in, in the Soviet territories. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, but actually, uh, it's not a proper game because we have too many chairs and too. Yes. Have, it should be the opposite. Would like to be, to, to, to yeah, yeah, it should be that. like lacking in order to work it properly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's. Um, it's very hard to to point at uh, some. Uh, so th th there are obviously some uh, some practices within uh, a number of uh, institutions which uh, which have been uh, conducted for quite some time, even before the the twenty fourth of uh, February. Uh, so for that matter, for instance. Uh, what I can name is uh, some institutions in Riga or in Warsaw, for instance, the Museum of Modern Art uh, and some others. But the problem is that uh, basically this kind of uh, situation, you know, that, that uh, it's a paradoxical situation because uh, somehow what has been revealed after the 24th of February, uh, we had known this even before. But at the same time, it came by surprise, right? It, and it caught us by surprise. It's really a kind of a, like a work of how the unconscious works, right? That we all knew that, but at the same time, we somehow were not aware of it, right? But so in this sense, I think it's a kind of a challenge for many, many cultural institutions um, across Europe because it's basically not only the matter of, uh, and it's not only the problem of uh, uh, some particular Ukrainian context, right? Like, like we have here. It can be also applied to other countries like, uh, I don't know, uh, Armenia or Moldova, right? Or, or even the Baltic countries, or even the Baltic states, right? Uh, for, you know, in many, many cases. And I think that uh, it's uh, this kind of, um, it's rather something which is uh, also inside uh, many cul uh, many uh, um, inside the modus operandi of many, uh, many cultural institutions uh, in the EU, but also elsewhere. Right, this kind of ignorance, but also um, sort of uh, um, symbolic identification with uh, with the discourse that. Uh, that they had been sticking to at the same time it appears that it's not really uh, something that is uh, so it's not really working but at the same time it's very hard to abandon it 
right? Uh, and uh, so I think th this is really a kind of a collective endeavor that has to be applied in order to, to overcome this. Uh, but uh, I, I don't mean here just to be really clear that uh, like, uh, we in the in the uh, wild post-communist East know how it works, and you over there don't know, right? I think it's also something that has to be worked through collectively. Uh, but uh, I think that um, you know what worries me, to be honest, here is uh, is that uh, so one of the uh, one of the features of this change uh, for me, I would say, is. Uh, the willingness to oh, to step beyond your own institutional borders what is the extent that you you, you are ready to go beyond because uh, i mean and it, it was also showed um, after the 24th of february when uh, when uh, like really many many cultural institutions uh, were rather uh, willing to work beyond, be, uh, in inside their bubbles though uh, but uh, i think like uh, it's also the question of how we treat pol pol institutional politicality of ours institutionally speaking right so wh uh, what kind of gestures and uh, are we ready to disturb our publics and authorities that we are also financially dependent on in order to push something further, right? So uh, at the same time, for me, honestly speaking, I mean, I'm not really, I don't really understand why so many cultural representatives in the West are afraid to do so because they don't risk anything at all pretty often. So for me, it's really kind of a miracle. Why, why, uh, but at the same time, so, um, so it's also uh, pretty often it's also uh, especially with regards to the museum framework right it's also the question how to reframe your own collections right because uh, for instance i know many cases when when uh, after some dis debates and uh, discussions like uh, with regards to uh, colonial discourse applied to, to to the history of art right uh, for example uh, it's a pretty colonial term, uh, so-called Russian avant-garde. It really doesn't really exist, right? Because it was not Russian, right? and avant-garde is not even national, for that matter. So, uh, and for many museums, it was like the question: Oh, but how we would frame Kandinsky? I mean, you know, it's also like, uh, but it also is not a, a symbolic price, but also very much a financial issue. But so it's really a kind of a huge kind of elephant like mechanism that you have to shift to certain level and to, to so I, I think we are just we haven't even started, I would say this process, which which needs to be conducted properly. But I think it's really very important that museum that it's not just a general idea of having an open museum hosting discussion, right, but to really work through your own background, but also together with others to involve as many others as possible and to, to really to be honest with yourself, right? I mean, also all of us, what, what, what is possible and what is not, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the okay. uh, so maybe uh, just two really short remarks. Uh, first, positive one. Uh, I think that there is a potential uh, mostly within artists and art institutions to make some change in this decolonial process because, I mean, uh, academia as a whole body is, uh, has a, oh, it, its own limitations. It, it's something very rigid, rigid very, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to move something inside that. Yeah? And as artists, sometimes, I mean, I always in between academia and art, so I can speak from both positions, I mean. Uh, it's easier to me. So with art uh, and with artists and artists, it's really easier to say something sometimes. Uh, so I see uh, a potential here. And second remark, I mean, in order to what also what Vasil mentioned, uh, so in order to have this productive dialogue, dialogues, not when we like teach vast and reverse this power dynamic, when, but when we work together, we need to start being perceived as partners, not as someone 
that who are underdeveloped or who you know just recipient of knowledge and not uh, and are unable to someone who's unable to product knowledge right and maybe some anecdotic uh, example here about uh, Vasil Yermilov in MoMA I mean this, I, I like this story I mean uh, my friend and colleague Tatiana Filevska who is uh, with the Ukrainian Institute I mean visited MoMA some six or five years ago and uh, noticed that a, pa a painting of Vasily Yermilov, who also was labeled as Russian artist, uh, despite his Ukrainian and he worked uh, in Kharkiv, that this painting was put upside down. I mean, literally upside down. And uh, she like left a long comment in this book for visitors came home, nothing changed. And I mean, she was speaking about like this uh, for five or six years, I don't remember. I would at least twice a year wrote an email. And it was totally ignored. I mean, nothing changed. I mean, it was still upside down because every time and every time she left uh, her remarks, it was like uh, automatic reply, like we are grateful for your contribution. You are helping us to make our museum better. I mean, blah blah blah. Nothing never changed. And she also mentioned that one day she said and like send them research. I mean, with examples, data, like with proper information. And also she had been ignored. But when the full scale invasion started. They suddenly changed it. And I mean, it took a war, I mean, actual war to change painting in a uh, right position. I mean, just think about it. Think of this example of knowledge production, of how do you perceive someone as part, you know? When someone starts dying, I, think. I mean, yeah, I will stop. Uh, and what do I do? Where do I go? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I also wanted to add on that. I mean, I think we have a perfect example in the room <clears throat> when <clears throat> we were sort of brainstorming on the kind of conversations that we would have here. We were asked by the collective <clears throat> if we were up for taking sort of the part of the institution in talking on how we have failed or how we can improve or and of course we were struggling with this question because we are individuals but we also represent an institution and an institution i mean it's a it's a machine made out of power games of politics of uh, and also wonderful things um of course as well but um uh, but so yes so you know we didn't feel like as, as individuals, we feel like we have a position and uh, we can contribute and what we are trying to do in the small, um, somehow to make some change uh, day by day. But as an institution, it's much more difficult to be, as you were saying, sort of honest. Honesty is not really, I, I cannot associate honesty to institutional world. Mm -hmm. Somehow, when Black Lives Matter happened, we did not make an institutional comment because we are friends with the American embassy. Outrageous. But somehow, we all did it individually, uh, but somehow there was no public sort of uh, interaction. And, and this is kind of, I think, the limit of an institution and maybe, yeah more on individuals or more like in a collective discourse but it should be more on the individuals that make up an institution rather than the institution as a machine that has no face I yeah. Yeah. And then i will ask you because for me i mean all these kind of power games and uh, <laughs> <laughs> But just sit here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just because I don't think that these uh, power games or political approaches are something that we have to separate ourselves from. Absolutely. It's quite the opposite, that it's really very nice instrument to, to <clears throat> have an impact on something. Absolutely. But I'm just really wondering, so if you think that if you had a statement with regards to BLM, you would be def deprived of friendship. With, with I, the, the I don't Assembly. think this, who at the time was representing the museum, did. Mm -hmm. And uh, but why? So is it somehow anti-American? Economical reasons. But BLM is not anti-American. Quite the opposite. It's super. I mean, it's super pro-American sort of move, right? I mean, yes. It's but what America stands for 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 centuries, right? Absolutely. But somehow it was. Uh, 
Okay. That question just I won't need you back. And then sit here. But I mean, um, sorry, is, is is it not what America stands for? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, at the time it was Trump that was running the White House. He was quite happy to see that happening. You know, so no, he does. He wouldn't want you would lose uh, influence with the American government if you stood with BLM. So, yeah, unfortunately, these powers uh, shape our institutions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I would love. I would love. I would love. I would love. But they, maybe because I mean, otherwise, it's. Um, it will never work, you know, if we, if we, because if we make concessions, right, step by step, we, we, we will find ourselves in, in a totally different position in, in some years. And we would say that, wow, we were so naive and stupid. Why did we do that? You know, it's, but it's really like sort of invisible. You make a decision here and there, yes. and then it's somehow, but I, maybe, but you know, maybe if you did that, I mean, the museum, for instance, maybe uh, now uh, after Trump, it would be different. So you never know, really, you know, but that, that's uh, the nature of politics, right? Yeah. That you have to really to test the limits because uh, otherwise yeah. it's, uh, yeah. Th there's that fight that we have to have, right? I mean, it, um, but it's just my naive, maybe. No, 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 not at all. I, I think that in this case, well, I would probably recommend uh, um, anarchist theory where we try to de hierarchize those places, those institutions. For example, saying that one institution isn't allowed to say something because of another creates a power dynamic and we have to work within ideologies of, uh, or anarchist theory to try and flatten those hierarchies. Yeah. So there are solutions. It's just that it's another thing we're not looking at. Yeah. 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 But that's a great, uh, great way to, to, to remember there are ways around this and that yeah, yeah. it's another thing we're blind to, sadly. Um, but, uh, but like, I think the, um, the example of, of the black squares that were shared during Black Lives Matter is also very significant in how, you know, institutions are very, um, it's very easy for institutions to go into discourse, right? Like it was so performative, all of these black squares that were posted by institutions in America under Trump, but at the same time, COVID was happening and the black staff and the indigenous staff of institutions, if they were part-time, they did not have health insurance. So also I think like, I don't know if this is like more of a general question, I guess. Um, and maybe to go back to what you were saying, Vasil, about the ways of, of sort of, um, yeah, thinking very um, politically about this production of knowledge, what are actual like effective ways of showing support without it um, in the end just benefiting the institution and not the actual, I would say, like artists and cultural workers. You were talking about like financial strategies, but I feel like what are institutions in Western Europe able to do that would be helpful to Eastern Europe? But they also would be helpful to, to the institutions themselves. But, but also, know? I mean, it's not just about helping others. Help yourself too. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes, but help yourself. <clears throat> yes, but going back to what uh, Agenata was saying, uh, so her book that, by the way, I don't remember the title, but I want to buy it. So maybe after, if you can. <laughs> The? It's called a, a Passion for Ignorance. Passion, great title, by the way, great title. Uh, but I mean, also the fact of saying, I'm going to clean my conscience by posting a black square. And, and on what you say, is it really relevant? Because if that justifies, and then it's like, okay, done, I did my job, and we can move forward, then maybe it's better you don't post that black square, but then you act on it. So yeah, it's also the hypocrisy. So it's a bit. Yeah. It's a but yeah, it's also a bit the paradox because on one side I feel like the institution has such a big network to actually do something but on the other they are not really free to do that something as an individual and the other way is like an individual is not going to make change alone but he can say more, well, I mean, in a, in a Western privileged situation where we can say what, yeah.
but so it's it's a very difficult battle also to be truth and to be part of an institution to be an individual like it's um it's difficult yeah um i wanted also to suggest that maybe we involve the online uh participants um if maybe you would like to comment on the topics that we discussed now what do we expect maybe from Western institutions or maybe you would have some other comments or questions. So please. I think I have uh, one maybe for Renata um, and also jumping on what uh, you, Alia, you were saying. Why it took us a war to, to react and to change and what can be learned from that and um, in relations to the coloniality, coloniality of the mind, what do you think, Renata? Why Ukraine wasn't on the... Um, I would say cultural agenda of Europe in the past years and uh, what we can learn for the future. Uh, yes, I, I can start uh, first. Um, yes, I definitely um, agree that uh, it, it, uh, the culture in, in Europe did not pay enough attention to uh, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has been going through you know, uh, democratization uh, they had, you know, incredibly important uh, street movements, uh, which, uh, you know, toppled uh, the previous regime. And also in some way, I would say that uh, we were not definitely paying attention to what happened in 2014 with the occupation of Crimea. And that was the biggest mistake. I think uh, not simply culturally, but, you know, really politically, um, the idea was that just to close the, the eyes uh, and, you know, kind of observe it as if, you know, it, it does not affect Europe. And in some way, there was also wrong perception that uh, uh, Putin will stop uh, with getting Crimea and he will not go further. Uh, which was, I think, uh, really uh, the ma major problem uh, of politics in Europe, since politi political elites were continuing uh, dealing with Putin and, of course, especially Germany, uh, hoping that economy uh, will somehow appease uh, his autocratic uh, tendencies, you know, having uh, with him an economic exchange, uh, buying uh, uh, his oil and gas. And that was, I think, uh, really a, a, a kind of a terrible mistake of, of Europe, which we are kind of living through now. Culturally, I think that there was also inner uh, kind of, let's say, a struggle going inside of uh, Ukraine in regard to Ukrainian language. Uh, when I visited uh, Ukraine myself uh, twice, uh, I, I saw that, uh, you know, I, I was there once before the occupation of Crimea and, uh, and uh, after, uh, you know, like uh, just uh, around 2000, uh, I think, 18. And um, uh, I myself was, let's say, surprised when my book, uh, Tyranny of Choice, was translated in Ukraine. It was translated into Russian language. And uh, my, uh, although it already existed in Russia, it was translated before uh, in St. Petersburg, I asked uh, my Ukrainian colleagues why they did it. And they said uh, that majority of people uh, at the university are actually reading in Russian and that they would have a better chance to um, promote the book, which was um, for me a sign that the Ukrainian language at that time you know, was not yet so fully present in the academic circles. Uh, like that, that's like a little anecdote, but I think that uh, um, the, the use of Ukrainian language uh, really started, um, you know, sort of like, I would say, uh, later uh, also in the in the kind of let's say academic circles uh, uh, being used as a written uh, a language for for the for the intellectual elites or being let's say uh, used widely in the university i'm, I'm sure that my uni ukrainian colleagues can maybe add to this but i think that actually the inside ukraine there was an important struggle going on to to elevate the ukrainian uh, language and also in a way uh, to to kind of get out of what we have been debating today, uh, the kind of the colon cultural colonization which has been going on um, already from the Soviet times on.
Yes, thank you, Renata. Um, I see that Faina raised her hand, so Faina Yunusova, who will also, by the way, participate in the program uh, with the workshop next year. So would you like to comment? Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm also part of a collective, uh, the artists from Uzbekistan based now in Germany. So when we uh, talk about uh, the to be how to be uh, anti-colonial, and uh, I think it's uh, important to mention that uh, today's praxis, uh, a lot of initiatives, uh, uh, they took talking about decolonization and also in Central Asia. Uh, but this initi initiative, sorry, uh, they organized by runaway Russians or people who pretended to be ex experts of this region, but not by from native people. Yes, and um, um, it's very difficult question also for me and also for, for the institu institutions, because um, I think it is necessary to look carefully at who is behind this, uh, this all initiatives or, um, or also who they are representing, or it is important to give all voices. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faina. I think um, that we have time left for one question or comment. If someone wants to do so, we also have words. Yeah, I will um, address it. Uh, Marina? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm also uh, a member of uh, Beyond the Post Soviet group. Um, I'm historian based in Paris. And I have a question for Leah. Uh, so she mentioned Golodomor, uh, uh, and my question is uh, how the memory of Golodomor is working out in Ukraine? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Yes, totally. Yeah. That what, that, that's what I was intended to say. So we will stuck here forever. I mean, I already, together with Andrei Dosley, we like, make a few projects about this and wrote some articles. So I don't know, do we really want to talk about it? Or maybe I just mention it briefly? I mean, it's... No, maybe it's too much. Maybe we, we put you yeah. in contact. Yes, maybe we can discuss <laughs> yeah, yeah, privately so you, because I mean, I don't so see how do I talk. spend less than half an hour and this answer. Yeah, yeah it's important. Yeah, I think um, I will, um, I'm looking at the time and uh, we need to wrap up. We also asked all participants uh, for today to think about one word that uh, we will uh, kind of, we're collecting a part of uh, Kind of vocabulary, but uh, this vocabulary also is not a vocabulary. You look up the world, but rather you, you take this word and you can think about and expand and yeah. have this word to, to act. Um, we already got some words. Some words. Yeah. We, we have a word uh, from the last time from Epanus, and it was the word C, because C it was important uh, um, entity or uh, it's, it's important uh, for. Uh, Estonian identity, sea, the excess of the sea, and sea is this kind of broad, fluid, but also sea was also military occupied and uh, they didn't have access to it, which was insane. It's a, it's a part of your identity, you, you go to the sea and then it's restricted. So it buries this memory of occupation, this trauma, but also it's a, it's a freedom yeah, to act liquidly and uh, to penetrate, to unite. And this is kind of my interpretation also, uh, thinking about this word. So I invite uh, you, Tatiana and Renata to give the word and then Vasil and uh, Mila. Yeah, I give the word apathy. Could you say just in two words, um, um, explain a little bit the yeah. choice? 
Um, in regard to what is happening today in Ukraine, my fear is that sort of apathy, uh, closing your eyes uh, among the observers uh, in Europe and elsewhere might be kind of the next uh, step of how uh, we are going to, you know, help uh, or, and react to, to the occupation. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Tatiana? My words, it's uh, peripheric. And for me, it's quite uh, strong um, words because I live in the periphery between the post Soviet spaces and also in EU. And for me, it's also interesting that uh, I live not in the focus as in the, in the West, but in the East. It's a like, periphery view that you are not focused in it, but it's something else, uh, not in the focusing. Thank you. Masil, yeah. okay. I'm, I'm not sure whether I would uh, go in details, but I would say that uh, from my side, I would name, uh, because I was like really doubting, devastation. devastation. It's also, yeah, it means so many things at the same time, right? I mean, parallelly uh, to, to like a, a kind of an all encompassing word for, for so many phenomena currently on the ground uh, in Ukraine. But it's also the question of the future, which I'm, I mean, not only me, but many politicians and, and cultural practitioners are struggling themselves with, like how to work with uh, such an unbelievable, unthinkable level of devastation. I mean, with regards to, because it's not just genocide, it's really like a ecocide. Uh, I mean, the Black Sea during the last more or less 10, 15 years will be simply a black, a dead sea, right? It's just the only, uh, like, if you think, for instance, of the demining process of Ukraine, because now it's more or less like two Austrias, like with regards to the Ukrainian territory, which have been mined, uh, only the demining process would take like decades. It's, it's something really uh, that we are, we all are even cannot even come to terms with and um, are not really, really like, cannot really grasp entirely what we are, what kind of moment we are in. I think, uh, so it also means that uh, some of us will collapse. I don't know how I'm supposed to say something after what you said. Uh, yeah, but yeah. anyway, for me, my choice is obvious. It's traces, but also remains. Uh, yeah, I couldn't decide uh, between two of these uh, words. So traces, I think it's pretty obvious choice because I, that's how I work. Uh, because, I mean, uh, power structures and colonial bodies, they like to operate that way that you don't find anything after. Yeah, they pretend that, uh, that, that, that it's like supernatural order of things, that's how the things are. And we have to find some traces in order to oppose this. I mean, which is not the case now, because now we have Arctic war, but I mean, in general. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, and we will continue. And I think that maybe we still can take the question that we put for the title of this event: How we, how can we be anti-colonial? How we can become anti-colonial? This is the question and uh, the mode of thinking that we can take with us as people, as uh, cultural workers, as institution. What does it mean? What means we need to 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 to, to get there? Um, yeah, so this is something uh, you need to take with you, to take home and uh, to continue. And the program will continue next year uh, and unfold in two uh, workshops, one by Faina Yunusova, who is uh, here with us, and one by Alistina Kahitze, and then will be continued by the team and uh, uh, getting back uh, to 
Luxembourg complex more mostly like European, European, Western, European, Western. European. Western. Don't but we're still, <laughs> we're still hoping to to have links between Western Europe and Soviet Union and to study the power dynamics, the parallel power dynamics. But thank you guys. It's all to the Modern team. Thank you.